All right, hello and welcome. My name is Natalie Raymond. I am the Digital Program Coordinator for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Stewards Defining and Assigning. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people who attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just to note, Zoom chat defaults to send to only panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. To share highlights on your favorite social media platform, use hashtag data ed. As always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the recording of the session, as well as slides and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter Aiken, PhD, is an acknowledged data management authority and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, past president of DEMA International, and associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are many firsts. Starting before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 organizations leverage data-specific savings that have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest venture is Anything Awesome. With that, let me turn everything over to Peter and get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. And welcome to you, Natalie. I hope the weather is pleasant out where you are. Uh, and, uh, at this point, we've got a nice day in the lower East Coast. I understand they're getting trapped uh, with the snow up uh, north of us here. But uh, anyway, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk with you about a subject that I've had a lot of work with and, and had some very good experiences. Uh, literally, I'm recovering from jet lag from uh, a trip from uh, Zurich and then South Africa in the same week, if you can imagine. Uh, I also made it back in time to see uh, Elvis Costello concert on Friday night. So how's that for a week? But anyway, you don't want to hear about that stuff. Interestingly, though, I fed the title, Data Stewards Defining and Assigning, into one of those uh, AI generators and it uh, generated this. So I think it kind of got a little bit of key on the defining and assigning and perhaps not really quite understanding what data stewards are. So let's see how we're gonna attack that over the next hour. First of all, why do we need a role uh, for data stewardship? It's not something that we've necessarily had formally in the past, although that's the, the clue to it. It has been done, it just hasn't been done as formally uh, around that. What are the stewards supposed to do then as far as being stewards uh, for, for the data of the organization in certain categories? And then the process of assigning stewards is a good place to ease into this whole thing. But an hour from now, we'll come back to the top and uh, look for your questions and answers, uh, which are always lots and lots of uh, fun around that. And again, driving forward, why do we need Data stewardship as a role? Well, first of all, we'll do some definitions. What do we mean by stewardship? Data stewards and data debt, some others. We'll talk about the role of strategy as being intertwined with data stewardship because there is no other place in the organization for data strategy to have a bigger role in what's going on in the data picture. Uh, and then we'll look at this as an architecture, as a general tool for the stewards. Uh, if I were in person at this point, I'd ask how many are starting their data steward journeys versus restarting it. And it turns out to be, seems to take about three times for everybody to get to the place where they have a good rolling initiative. I don't mean that to be discouraging. It's just that it is a new field and we're, we're still learning our way through it. But a good way to think about it, and perhaps even more importantly, to communicate about stewardship is the idea of actually musicians. Now, as musicians, we want to be singing on the same sheet of music. And that's what we want to do if we're going to leverage our existing data and change our existing practices to something that is more supportive of organizational strategy. And I'll start off with a quick definition here that I don't really like, but I want to just sort of address it head on. Absolutely, there are people in your organization who are key to this. But of course, that's bad business practice to be dependent on a single individual and also to count yourself as perhaps more than uh, other members of the team. So while it's not a great 
definition here. It's a, a good starting place and a, perhaps a, a place to introduce some misinformation. Yes, data stewards are important and not everybody can and should be a data steward, but it is a really key role. Let's take a look how that would go from a, a definitional perspective. So steward would be a person employed to manage another's property is the, the easiest definition to come from there, a custodian, a caretaker, a steward of the estate uh, in that. And that gives us steward, so we're okay with that. Uh, next one that is stewarding is the process of managing or look after. Uh, again, they have in parentheses another property, we'll call it another data. Therefore, a data steward is managing the data assets on behalf of stakeholders in the best interest of the organization. Uh, Jeanette McGilvery gave us a wonderful definition many, many moons ago, and it's no reason to change it at this point. He is to represent the interests of stakeholders and take an enterprise as opposed to a localized perspective and have time dedicated enough to be accountable and responsible for it. He, in the concept of data stewards, is trust, the element that we have a, uh, a belief in the reliability of someone or something. Again, definition from Google there. And lastly, introduce the word fiduciary. If you're not familiar with it, you have a fiduciary relationship between certain types of individuals in your existence. Typically, it would involve around finance matters, uh, health matters, and perhaps legal advice uh, would be three that would come to mind for starters uh, around that. So if we look at this in totality, we're talking about a, a well understood role here that is to manage on behalf of somebody else in the interest of the organization, uh, and in this case, the data assets, not all of them, of course, but a portion of them that are reasonable in order to take a look at. Let's step back just a touch. Uh, again, from a steward perspective, one who actively directs from Marion Webster and therefore a data direct, uh, component is one who actively directs the use of organizational data assets in support of mission objectives. Now, Unfortunately, this leads us to a couple of things to, to take a look at. As I said before, it's a new concept uh, around this. And this is a Gartner chart uh, that's well done, but I, I think it is, represents sort of a challenge. The role of stewards is defined as data analytics steward in here. And they've done some color coding, if you can see, that's a data and analytics role, so a key function in order to do it. But uh, then there's also something called a citizen data steward, which I don't quite understand because it's assigned a business role. So that, that's confusing to me. And neither of these are must-have roles. I would respectfully disagree with this. And you can see that there are a lot of components uh, in all of this. I will argue that the knowledge possessed by data stewards in a well-run organization are the key differentiator between success and failure of governance and therefore data programs all the way around. Let me now move on to a slightly controversial topic uh, as well, and that is the idea of data ownership, a very big challenge. If you have it, most organizations, they start to say, this is my data and it's mine and I need to have it uh, around here. Reference instead the terms fiduciary relationship or if they insist on owning something, give them ownership of the data requirements within the defined portion of the life cycle that they are looking at. In other words, there are upstream activities of which they do not own those data requirements. And there are downstream activities that probably should be taken into consideration as you're defining the local ones uh, in here. Again, the further up we put our controls, the better off we'll be able to do this. If you get real pushback on the concept of data ownership, uh, you can just instead say, what data would accounting own? Uh, because accounting is a, a uh, an area that inherits data from other parts of the organization uh, all the way around. And this is unfortunately a result of what has been considerable confusion as to data responsibility. So imagine having to take your new stewards and, and their first perspective is perhaps that IT thinks data is a business problem. If they can connect to the server, my job is all taken care of. And the business thinks that IT is managing the data adequately. After all, what else would the title of chief information officer B. And as a result, of course, data has fallen into this gap between business and IT, where we need to reestablish the, the patterns of cooperation in these areas in order to repair the great amounts of data debt that organizations have that aren't quite as visible as that slide would give it to you. Data debt is things that get in the way. Think of it as, as uh, clogging the veins of the organization. It slows progress, it decreases quality, and increases our costs and presents greater risk uh, to the organization. 
let's zero in on the role of this fiduciary piece just for a starter. What is the, the purpose of it? It's a person who's legally obligated to act in the best interest of the individual group or company. And this includes, again, as I said before, lawyers, trustees, doctors, uh, other types of activities up to and including formal legal guardians. The, the real key to this is that there are three duties of uh, the fiduciary relationship, and one is to act in good faith. Uh, they're very clean uh, in, in that sense. The duty of care, that you have a duty to care for the data that you're looking after at this point. And your duty is that the organization as a whole is your loyalty uh, around this area. Uh, fiduciaries, they have ethical and legal standards they must adhere to. And not knowing this, we also end up with the sort of perhaps the biggest business challenge that we have around data. And that is that when we build data things, it's often the case of the princess on the T. I've just circled in yellow down there a T at the bottom of a 20 uh, high mattress stack. And yet the princess up here at the top is sleepless because of this inherent flaw. Similarly, data flaws that are built into new systems have extremely challenging areas that are locks these imperfections in for the life of the application. It restricts the potential investments that are going forward and decreases the ability to leverage the uh, organization's data. 20 to 40% of IT budgets are devoted to maintaining, migrating, converting, and improving data as it evolves through the process. That's a tremendous amount of savings, and it also improves your speed at the same time. Bad data models, bad data P's uh, cause everything else to take longer, cost more, deliver less, and present greater risk. Thank you to Tom DeMarco for that uh, wonderful uh, component of uh, articulation of it. Uh, an article in Forbes at the height of the pandemic in July of 2020 gave the value of American Airlines at $6 billion and the value of United Airlines at $9 billion. But the reason they picked this as a contrast is that investors were apparently willing to value the data in there between 20 and 30 billion in the case of American and at least twice what United was worth as an airline. If this had been true, wouldn't it have been more sensible to buy the airline, throw away the airline bits and just keep the data? I don't know, but I think this represents an underutilization. I firmly believe that if the CEOs of these two airlines understood how to unlock the value of that data, they would have. Uh, because they have every incentive in the world to do this. This gets us to the topic of data strategy in the context of stewards. So strategy, uh, again, just very briefly, is typically done as an organizational strategy, and then it has been filtered in many cases in the past through uh, IT strategy in here. And I... This is wrong. Example, uh, Morgan Freeman here, because he says it so well, this is wrong. And the reason for that and the way it should be done is that data strategy is distinct and probably more influential on IT than IT is on strategy around that. Uh, again, not to, to pick on anything particular, but when you think about the types of assets and things we have been doing over the years, one of the, th one of the fortunate things about uh, being able to be active in this field for 30 years plus is to observe that these organizations have not changed over the course of 30 years. And that, that is a, a very significant thing. They're still managing uh, the same data sets that they were managing in the first place, perhaps with different technology, perhaps in different places, uh, but uh, that's a, a much more solid component. The strategy as a concept wasn't even really introduced to the general public until about 1954, and it represented this master plan after the management consultants got a hold of it and said, we're going to put together a thing for you. Now, the, I want you to think differently about this because I believe that the management consultants have hijacked this term and that the proper way to think of it is strategy derived from military use. After all, this is where it, quote, has been successful. And definition here is a pattern in a stream of decisions. So this makes strategy much more of a process and much less of a thing. Let me give you three brief examples. Walmart's business strategy uh, in a past life was everyday low price. And they understood this and their customers understood this and their suppliers understood this and their critics and their adherents understood this. It was a unifying uh, feature of the organization and a very clear and successful implementation of an organizational strategy, not just in the organization, but throughout society in this case uh, on here. Second example of a strategy here is Wayne Gretzky. And uh, he basically says, I could either chase a hard rubber uh, plastic ball around that roots across uh, shiny ice and very slick ice and try to chase it, or I can skate to where I think the puck will be 
raise my hand and say I'm open, and then I will score as I move in on that. Uh, Napoleon at Waterloo is our third example here, and the question was, how do I defeat the competition when their forces are bigger than mine? And the answer, of course, is divide and conquer. Now, let's look a little bit very closely at this one. Napoleon observed that the British troops were uh, supplied out of Ostend, and the uh, Prussian troops were supplied out of Liege. And being a good battle commander, he understood that when faced with uh, significant harm and peril, a troop has a tendency to run more towards their uh, uh, supply chain then away from their supply chain uh, on this. So he came up with the divide and conquer plan, uh, which is still taught in, in U.S. military schools uh, today. The idea, of course, is to hit him in exactly the right place so that the red troops move off in the left direction that they're headed and the black troops uh, move off in that direction. Then, of course, very quickly turn around and conquer. And the idea was, of course, first of all, go to the right and remove the French and then go to the left and remove the British. Uh, again, just very, very Simple strategy, but uh, on the other hand, let's think about it perhaps. It seems simple. Hit both armies really hard at the right spot, then turn right and defeat the British. Uh, excuse me, turn right and defeat the uh, Prussians, then turn left and defeat the British. And oh, by the way, please do this while somebody is shooting at you the entire time. Uh, it makes absolutely good, I think, evaluation to say that this would represent a complex strategy, particularly considering that most of the soldiers didn't want to be there. But we've spent a bit of time talking about strategy, and the idea is that strategy, when it comes to the data level, should be a simple concept. Uh, my friend John Ladley gave a quote that I think I'm going to adopt. Uh, thank you very much, John, with full attribution. And that is that the data strategy uh, should be the uh, chapter of your organizational strategy that deals with data. Uh, I like that a lot. Let's look at a, a particular other type of perhaps complex governance, though. Can you imagine being a steward in an environment that was this complex, and I'm not saying this is good or bad or even what it's particularly for, but I think you will again all agree that it is complex uh, in order to try and, and work on this. So let's go back to our definition of strategy, a pattern in a stream of decisions, and understand that strategy guides workplace, excuse me, work group activities. Uh, the idea that within a work group, we understand our common goals and objectives and, and move forward. Uh, in a unified fashion is a very, very important concept around strategy, and that is what has to be communicated ultimately down to our stewards. So let's talk for a minute about governance and architecture. Again, why are we doing this? Well, corporate governance has been around forever, except that we had, before the pandemic, the idea that perhaps it wasn't all about the bottom line, and we'll see whether that goes anywhere, but it was nevertheless a, a robust start to that effort. Of course, if we have corporate governance, we don't have IT governance, which looks at measuring results, addressing key areas. Again, the five that have been identified here are soon in blue. Now I want you to go to data governance definitions. And these are seven of them we've used over the years, sort of foundational in nature uh, around this. And of course, you all know what an elevator pitch is. You get on the elevator, an executive steps in and looks over and says, oh, you tell me what these data stewards are doing and what is the data governance and all this other you've got 20 seconds or so to not look like a fool and give a project advertisement for your program of course well what i'd like you to take away from here is perhaps a definition of data governance that's a little bit different from the ones that i showed you i, I like to use managing data with guidance and the reason is that guidance then becomes the predominant term and governance is not the predominant term of course, also, you might ask the question in reverse, would we want our sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset managed without guidance? Uh, I think not. And again, if we look around the organization, stewards are the individuals, the job class that is going to make a difference in these areas. When we're all speaking to upper levels of management, we change this definition just slightly with the addition of the word decision, managing data decisions with guidance, uh, very important in that concept here as well, because most uh, managers make data decisions, they just don't know that they make data decisions. Let's look at how stewards fit into the composition of a data governance organization uh, in here. Uh, we're gonna have leadership, we're gonna have uh, data subject matter experts, MEs, we call them oftentimes. We've got everybody else, and of course, we've got our stewards that are really focusing in here as trustees uh, in here. 
most organizations will take this sort of left half of the diagram and say that's our data governance organization in here. And we're going to define the role of acquiring and maintaining resources for leadership, which means there has to be a positive return on investments. Again, whose back does that come out of? The stewards, right? We've got uh, feedback and uh, uh, decisions, and the stewards are the ones that are charged with guiding leadership through the decision-making process, as well as implementing the results of the decision, which means there has to be some actions taken. We have to do things differently than we used to in the past. Again, there's an ongoing feedback, ideas, concepts, uh, and guidance type of role in all of these uh, things. Now we're going to talk a little bit about architecture. And architecture is just about things, the function, what those things do, and how those things interact. Uh, you can see here, these are two very silly things that are interacting, but uh, it gives us the ability to define a controlled or a common vocabulary. And that's the best example for most organizations because they start to come back and they say, well, why are we doing this architecture stuff? And the answer is, we need to get all the musicians on the same sheet of paper. This is our common or controlled vocabulary that we're pulling into place so that we stop the siloed towers of Babel in here and understand conceptually as an architectural component, the interconnections and the commonalities among the data pieces in a way that's shared by three groups, the business users of that data, the technical group supporting that and the systems as well. This is what we mean when we say the language of data governance and especially data stewards is in fact metadata because unfortunately most organizations have architectures that are not understood, not documented and therefore not useful to the organization. Let's now drop into our, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, I wanted to say data for that as well. Let's drop into our, what are we supposed to do? And uh, again here, the idea is to look at challenges that are bogging us down because most people are unaware of the effect of data debt and it just makes everything, as I said before, faster, uh, excuse me, slower, uh, uh, take longer, deliver less, uh, uh, present greater risk to the organization around that. We'll look at a, a framework for stewardship that is derived from a, a well-established uh, framework, and it's a very good way of thinking about this. Then I'm going to relate our activities as stewards to the role of uh, fire station, and uh, we'll talk about that. Then we'll look at stewardship in the context of overall data governance uh, around that. So again, let's dive in. Uh, we've already said don't say no. Reference instead this fiduciary relationship. It is just appalling uh, to do this uh, absent uh, from that. And I know it comes up twice in here, but it's still fairly oops, important. And I just went to the absolute wrong slide. Give me a sec. Uh, let's see. There we go. What you get when you type the wrong number into the slide. By the way, any guesses in the chat how many slides I'll get through today uh, around all of that? Uh, it's always sort of fun to push the limit. There we go. So, oops, I still got the wrong slide. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Typically, what happens in organizations is that they recognize they've gotten to the point where they have data, but they're not able to access the value. And the reason for that is because we're overly dependent on human beings or the wetware uh, that is in between our ears, these knowledge workers and their set of informal communications is often described as the weakest link in this. And stewardship is designed to formalize these roles to be available if the organization decides to measure uh, the activities in here, which means they can be costed, and an organization can then determine an effective ratio of uh, data that could be uh, covered uh, by stewardship around all of this. Again, the first most united purpose of stewards is to help the organization use its data better to support the mission. And I mentioned or at the top here a framework idea, which is the idea of guiding analyses, organizing the project data, enabling the ability to make priorities, assessing progress, coming up with rules if we're building houses, we said don't put up the walls until the foundation inspection has been passed. But once you do that, put the roof on as soon as possible so we can work in inclement weather. And again, make it all dependent on uh, funding uh, sources, continued funding. So a framework for stewardship uh, is a wonderful uh, contribution to the intellectual literature here, which is there is a personal mastery, a vision around this. There's a component of mentoring that comes into it, obviously diversifying opinions, but having the vision 
in this. And a certain aspect of risk-taking and experimentation, vulnerability as well as maturity on this. Again, making mistakes is a human activity, so we would expect that. But overall, we would be delivering uh, results around this. And so with that sort of framework for stewardship, I present to you in this case a framework for data stewardship, which is the idea that there will be organizational data challenges. Sometimes it's as easy as complying with Basel III. And I don't mean that lightly at all. It's just that that has a well-articulated set uh, that other types of, of uh, organizational data challenges may not come as well-defined as uh, compliance types of activities. Either way, we have to make a decision when we encounter these of some sort of strategic nature. Uh, we're going to put them in the bucket and address them some other time, or we're going to address them now with our data stewardship engine. And that, again, regulation and policy, these stewardship activities would fall underneath it, but always falling into sort of reactive and proactive. And we'll talk about the, the ratios in that. That will then yield value. And some of that value is monetary. Some of it is non monetary. And the key is, of course, to get good at the process so that the value of the results become increasing up to the point of diminishing returns, in which case we have adequately sized our data stewardship organization. I mentioned before the firehouse metaphor around this. And the idea is really, of course, if you know anything about fire departments, their professionals and volunteers spend part of their time waiting for something exciting to happen so they can go out and help the communities by saving lives in the face of these kinds of threats. But fire departments also do an awful lot of proactive work, education in our schools and community centers where they are helping people to understand things like the biggest cause of residential fires in today's world is an incandescent bulb. That doesn't mean the incandescent bulb has gotten uh, worse. It means that we have made our houses safer uh, up to that standard, and that is now the greatest threat. Uh, similarly, I mentioned the risk-taking pieces as well. We used to have a TV show called MacGyver. Harmless. He was the guy that could fix everything with duct tape. And that's an important consideration for us, too. We will have novel situations that we're facing and therefore novel uh, approaches that we'll have to take in order to address these. I like to uh, reference it as data and duct tape. And were I a songwriter, I would certainly uh, have you a song about that, but I'll spare you that. The last piece of this on the roles here is the idea that, of course, a um, organization can take a group on as full-time or part-time. And given that set of choices, it's real easy from my perspective. And I'm back from pulling the driveway alarm because <laughs> my wife is back in her truck up. Anyway, if you have a choice of 10 people, 10% of the time, or one person, my advice would be to take the one person. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, if you have this ability to get into this in a more in-depth way, 10% of ten, anybody's time or even one third of their time is still a, a difficult series of choices that the organization has to make. But if you're full-time, this is your job. You're a professional about it and you're gonna try to improve your ability to serve in this role in the organization. So a much easier way of starting the coherence that you need to have in order to have your organization start to move forward on this. Now, next chapter around here, uh, I think the chapter, I'm not reading you guys a book, uh, but a very well-run survey over the years has been run by our colleague, Randy Bean, who has all these results at the newvantage.com website down there at the bottom. But the question is, uh, he's asked people years after year after year, are you driving innovation with data? And most are not. Are you competing on data and analytics? Most are not. Are you managing data as a business asset? Most are not. Are you creating a data-driven organization? Are you forging a data-driven culture? Again, most are not. And while these are not great statistics, uh, there's some real interesting patterns in the data. I have that in another set of slides for you. Uh, but you ask the question here over the years, are your problems primarily technology-focused or people and process-focused? 
And in 2018, you can see it was 80-20. It never got back up to that level. 2019, 5%, 10%, 7 8% in 2021. It's clear that the data challenges around our organizational inability to utilize data are people and process based. And data governance is the only resource to address these challenges. And data stewards are the only people in the data governance organizations that have to do any work. Ah, well, I'm sure I'll get some questions on that, but uh, let's, let's uh, bring them on and uh, have a discussion about them. I just, the more I see this is the more I'm convinced that this is the right approach to this. Poor data you see manifests itself in a number of ways that your data stewards just naively won't understand. But almost all data problems are filtered through some sort of an IT or business process combination or combination. The example I'm showing here is very simple because I'm only showing one filtration uh, around this. Uh, many times it, it goes very far downstream before we actually do get the uh, results of this data being incorrect. And only when we are able to connect the dots all the way around can we understand that these poor results have a unified cause. And that is that the idea within organizations, when you look at trying to do this individually by everybody from the outside trying to fix it at the, ex, uh, at the edges, uh, instead of having a dedicated team to focus on this, it's just folly. Uh, and uh, it, no matter what happens, we continue to see these things be problematic uh, around here. Uh, again, the idea here is that we need to be able to have the organization be able to get to the critical mass uh, in order to do this. Let's now talk about the role of data governance in here. And again, this is to put the stewards in context. Most organizations have sort of vague ideas about what's going on uh, in these areas. But uh, of course, eventually the data governance organization is formed and data starts to improve over time. However, the perception oftentimes on the part of management is that this is slow and uh, having to measure progress in quarters bugs them much less the fact that the real impacts may not be felt for years uh, in some instances uh, around this. So what happens is that organizations say, yeah, you need to do something a little bit more proactive with some wheels on that snail there, bud, and uh, let's get that uh, rolling out and make the data improve as a result of focus. Now, this is active data governance, and I don't see uh, a lot of organizations indicating that this is something that they should do, but I see a lot of organizations practicing this. Uh, and so I think we're, we're beyond the point of this as an introduction. This gives us the ability to get better feedback and to start employing a professional class of individuals that will exist here from this point onwards as our data professionals, uh, one component of our data professional staff uh, in here. And just a quick side note here that while we're pretty good about articulating when data things happen, we're not quite as good or we haven't been quite as good about making sure that those data things that are happen are tied to organizational things that happen here. And so the more we can practice at this particular uh, activity and make it easier, and this is really the only reason I find in organizations that they have trouble with this is because they haven't practiced it, uh, which is just unfortunate uh, in terms of what they're attempting to do. So it's very possible to put together very, very big returns on investment on these uh, initiatives in here. It's not just an unfunded mandate. It's definitely not the way we should let people think about it, but in fact, a strategic investment in your ability to use data better in your business. Let's uh, also then confess to another component here, which is that the role of the data stewards is in fact generally larger than we uh, originally described it early on here. And that within that role uh, of the brown box here, they are really responsible for making sure an awful lot of these things happen within their areas. So the scope of stewardship efforts is quite uh, large in most instances uh, around here. The, the key to this is to understand that your organization is going to have to take a both proactive and reactive role in addressing these topics. And that that proactive and reactive role will also include some things that are not considered uh, part of data governance. But what you should ask is, well, whom else is going to do them? Because if I don't have a group focused on these people and process problems, I will not, in fact, be able to uh, overcome the good things that data can do just by throwing more data in front of good people. I'll take a quick side deviation here too, and I do a slide that I didn't have a 
us partic particular uh, uh, slide for, but it's the role data literacy plays in all of this. And of course, the idea here is that stewards need to be more data literate than everybody else. So we can clearly see there's some gradations that we could pay attention to from that perspective as well. So now you have an idea of what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to take data and move it in a way that will increase its ability to support the organization's ability to achieve its strategic objectives uh, in here. We look specifically uh, around uh, several things, which is data debt, and sort of a framework for this, whether you have a ability to distinguish between these reactive and proactive foci uh, that you're looking at. And finally, how the stewards play a role in all of this. And it's a very encompassing role. Uh, think about it, just who else is going to do it. So last section of this, we're going to talk into assignments of data stewards, the idea that you're going to start the process. And first of all, there should be a, a very much of a concept here that says these are going to result in tangible improvements. But even when you make those improvements, it's important to document those improvements because those improvements, while they will be uh, seem simple uh, for two others, they'll not have a good idea of how much they actually add up. So I'll give you just a very brief example, which is that I had an organization at one point that had a query that ran a billion times uh, a day. Now that's a lot. And the idea of this query running a lot just gave me the question of, I wonder the person that wrote it, did they in fact understand query optimization? And this is not necessarily a topic that stewards should get into, but necessarily they should understand that there are always better ways of doing things and we should be able to identify what they are and evaluate them and respond accordingly. So in this instance, it turned out that the person who had written the query had not really understood the process of query optimization. It was possible to rewrite that query, but that we were able to reduce it by a quarter. Now that's not a lot, 25% is a, a good amount, but if I take a quarter of a billion, I'll take that any particular time as opposed to trying to find out the <clears throat> underlying causes of why we can't reduce costs around that area. So let's dive into our last section here now, which is again, the idea of assigning them. And I'm gonna just give you some advice, which is hopefully makes sense. It, is that you should start simply and that you should follow and understand and make sure everybody understands the differences in cadence between IT projects and data governance approaches, which is then talks to the need for a different structural approach. There's some foundational prerequisites that we'd like to get to uh, around this. And then finally, simplicity, agility, and practice uh, around here. So let's dive in again and just say that the sources of data are many in just a healthcare environment. And this is like, if you are looking at your data source being an order catalog, then the steward for that is probably a member of the IT staff. The, the point of this is that it's a lot of different definitions. And while there are, in fact, a lot of different types of stewards, this represents the thinking of an organization that has matured into this setup because it works for them. This is not the result of everybody pre-planning and attempting to guess in advance what's happening here. And let me be even more explicit about it. So while these are excellent definitions of stewardship and, and showing that there are multiple roles in this, it's probably not a good idea to introduce all of this at once to your organization. So my colleague, uh, David Lotion has written a wonderful book on data stewards and I highly recommend it to you but he's describing here a number of different types of stewards and I'm not going to read them to you because it's not the time to start thinking about them from that perspective. Because of course, if you get this many different types of data stewards that are in here, then of course you need an auditor and then a manager of some sort uh, in order to, to put them together. No, this is overkill, confusing, and remember that most people are less observant and care less about this than we do. So we have our definition of stewards, one who directs the use of data assets in support of mission objectives. All right, well, problem is externally, this is not well understood. There's sort of data stuff that people hear and then there's data management, and data governance, and what's the difference between those two again? And oh my gosh, now we're going to introduce this concept of data stewards in here as well. It's not 
not possible to most people to do this. So keep the comprehension at the programmatic level. What's going on here? We have a data program. Stewards are part of that data program. If they want to ask you a follow-up question, great. By all means, speak with them about it. But it's just so difficult to try to get this even understood within the data groups, much less across them uh, in organizations. Here is a wonderful series of charts, though, and I wish I knew where it was from because I would love to give them credit that uh, just appeared in my inbox at one point that what we're really trying to figure out is what do they do in our organization? They need to improve data's value and help the organization achieve that, but they should also be the primary evangelical uh, force inside the organization to increase the scope and rigor of data-centric practices and ensure efficient and effective data management practices. And unfortunately, these last couple are not typically included in there. Uh, it's just a, while it's a wonderful idea, it's not been practical up to this point for most organizations to do this. And let me take you to this concept of what I call an organizational data machine. Now, this is the external perception of the organization by outsiders, whether they're business partners or customers or regulators. All of your inputs are data and all of your outputs are data. And so everything that goes in is somehow transformed added value. And the question is, if we add too many controls and standards into the process, that becomes expensive and slow. And if we do too little, we miss opportunities. So the answer is clearly in between these two extremes. The people who are best able to judge where that balance should be, and more importantly, where you should start in your journey along these lines so that you can be most effective uh, around this, and they'll understand inherently the dependencies, are your data stewards on this. And let's be frank at this point. You're probably in a situation like many organizations of not knowing as much about your data that you'd like to. Uh, we'll say it's a, a, a known quantity and 20% of it and unknown is 40%, uh, excuse me, 80% uh, around here. Well, similarly, over time, we'd like to improve what is known and how it's known around these topics in here. And eventually, we'd like to get to the point where we realize we don't need to understand anymore and that, in fact, that one fifth of the data we might be able to dispose of entirely after appropriate vetting, which could result in a tangible reduction in our cloud storage bill, which is a very nice way of starting to describe this uh, in terms that others will understand. The key determinant of all of this, of course, is interoperability. And that is what gives us the value in this particular process. Now, some of you may have encountered the term systems thinking before. This is a wonderful uh, quote from Friedhoff Capra. Uh, oops, I'm so sorry. I went to the next page. Do that one more time. A couple times here. There we go. We got that. And oh, that's just an error on my part. Well, we'll keep it up here for a second. Hang on. Let me go back and put it up because this is important stuff, guys. Uh, the idea is that. The only way to fully understand what's going on from this series of perspectives is to understand the relationships as well as the context with everything else. So again, the forest or the trees, or to understand that relation in part of the whole. And we're looking for system thinkers in data stewardship so that we can have these individuals take a idea and say we're going from upstream uh, to downstream in this logical progression of value addition. Now, I mentioned before, the organizational strategy provides context for the data strategy, and ideally the data strategy is that chapter in the organizational strategy that deals with data uh, in there. If you've got fortunate to have that, that's wonderful. Uh, if not, uh, again, reconsider in terms of how much effort you're putting into the actual document, and then balance that out by the ability to practice what you're doing more. Uh, around a series of strategic cycles uh, on this. And of course, our stewards are the implementers and they are what we are implementing. So data strategy must be expressed in tangible, concrete business goals that everybody else understands uh, within that. And that the language, as I've said before, of data governance is metadata. And therefore, these two appear highly in the stewards area. They are going to be working in these areas in a way that's going to allow them 
to continue to add value from a very comprehensive perspective. Remember in Peter's world, the data stewards are full time. Even if you have just one, it's still a great place to start because that individual will be so uh, uh, visible uh, that they will have no choice but to succeed massively. We want to finish this component off by coming back and just making sure we've got feedback loops within the entire process. Now, looking at this and saying the role of stewards, they look like they're at the bottom of the food chain, but actually you need to invert this. I could probably make a diagram of this at some point, but that the stewards are clearly at the top uh, of this pyramid because they have all of that inherent knowledge and they are tasked with making sure this is documented. Now that's to say that you wanna support your stewards with appropriate resources if they are uh, working in a case tool environment, that's terrific if they happen to just have scribes for meetings and things like that, whatever it is they need to do so they can focus on their goal, which is to take the value of the organizational data and make it even better than it currently is. One last point on this, uh, which is kind of related to scope activities. Uh, and again, most organizations, they hand the stewards and say, okay, you go start with the A's and you do the B's and you do the C's. Ah, no, 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 that's the wrong question. Instead, what we should ask is, is this data item within the scope of our stewardship practices? And the answer may be next year or five years from now or never or absolutely. But those are very different from trying to do everything. Let's get to a couple of dirty specific secrets. 80% of the data that you have in your organizations is ROP. This is the nature of data debt. You have multiple sources. If your organization only has customer data in less than 13 systems, you are above average. Our standards are absolutely low given this context. So rather than how are we going to manage it all, let's instead find some things that if we manage them would make a direct impact on the organization or an easy song like Top Stick to play. And let's play that song and learn how to do it. Uh, together uh, around this. Finally, document either way, because that documentation has to be the corporate record of what's going on in the data world. I've already told you the story of the billions of queries that uh, run in these instances. And that's because what we're doing here requires what I call a highly tuned data sandwich. The idea is that some components of literacy, perhaps uneven supplies of data and standards application in the organization are kind of clunky and causing sand in the gears. What we'd like, of course, is for customers to have seamless experiences. And the only way we're going to do that is by improving literacy, supply, and standards. And once again, stewards are the source of that expertise. This is what they have to learn how to do to get these pieces to work well together. And this can't happen without investments in engineering and architecture. And I had to go all the way to India pre-pandemic uh, to see on the tax register of the tea farm that I was visiting, the wonderful Deming quote, quality engineering architecture work products do not happen accidentally. And of course, the same thing is true for data pieces of it as well. This is because of course, data is not a project, it's a durable asset. It has a life that lasts a long time uh, on this, more useful than one year. Uh, if you want to get into some of these topics, again, probably not a direct steward topic, but certainly of interest is the monetization components that are inherent in some types of data. And uh, uh, Doug Laney has done a wonderful job on his Infonomics book of describing some of those components. I mentioned earlier the cadence that was involved in this. So certainly we invest in our customers and hope that their data will have an asset value of greater than one year. If you think back to the example from the Forbes article on the two airlines, uh, they were clearly at least valued by some investors as being more valued for their uh, data that they had than in fact the operation of the airline. I don't know about you, but if I could get just the data and let somebody else run the airline, it's a tough job. I'm glad some people do a great job of it. Um, but it's certainly not anything that I have any expertise at uh, on this. This is what we're talking about in the cadence uh, of this. And that, while it may be reasonable to do two week sprints or uh, you know, increments uh, around this, 
they instead what we need to think of is that data evolution is going to take much longer because data has to flow through the systems. And so the evolution can be measured in as long as years because data evolves. It's typically not created. And that's an important thing to consider because many people think of data stewardship and data governance as projects. If it is a project, then it has a start and a beginning, an objective start and an objective end. And data, of course, has neither. And consequently, because it evolves, it is more stable, but it is also not suitable for project management. And it is requisite on organizations to put in place a program. You will no longer need your data program. Sorry, I'm not on the right side there. Uh, you will no longer need your data program. There we go. Uh, when uh, you no longer need your HR program, right? Or your finance program as you're thinking about it. And that's a really good way to think about it. And the argument is very straightforward. Do you think there will be more or less data in the future? Obviously, most people will say more. And do you think that uh, uh, we will uh, have more or less expertise in the future? We'd like to have more expertise. But on the other hand, what steps are we taking to develop that expertise? And this is where the investment in stewardship uh, is probably an even stronger indicator of potential success than the existence or non-existence of a data governance program in and of itself. I want to go back to this slide, uh, just bring two points here that I jumped ahead to, and I apologize for being a little confusing, but that's the fun part about a webinar, right? Uh, if your organization is going to be creating agile topics, and agile is a, the best way we have come up with of improving the quality and the speed with which we create good component software uh, on this. These data requirements are a prerequisite to agile development. And if you recall a couple slides back, I had you all thinking that not we don't want to own data ownership. We don't want them to own it, but we can own the requirements. And those requirements play a direct role here. If you don't have those data requirements well objectively understood at the start of your agile sprint, you need to sprint off in a different direction because the only possible result in this is to create additional data files. Again, Part of data debt is for years and years, we have taught all IT students, computer science, computer engineering, and information systems, that the answer to every data problem is to build a new database. And therefore, we're surprised when we have uh, these, these uh, silos that have been uh, springing up all around us in this. It's the need for a program in order to do these things. In fact, the way to think about your organization is perhaps changing as well. In most organizations, there are plans that are at the top, and those become data, and they're transmitted down through the ranks so that others then get some instructions. And in some cases now, you actually manufacture things. But of course, if we know anything about uh, uh, the various manufacturing, we are manufacturing components and then maybe assembling them uh, today. Again, it's going to be different for every organization, but increasingly, you're going to have more of a data focus. Your organization is all about data until it's not just about data. And that's an important consideration to think. It changes the mindset uh, around this. I was talking to a logistics group uh, on uh, in South Africa the other day, and, and they had good expertise uh, in these things, but they also were good at understanding the marketplace. And uh, we talked about them for perhaps providing advisory services into the rest of the marketplace. The question to ask is what business are you in? And uh, it's a very good question to take a look at. Let's also say that stewards have an important role to play here as well, which is the organizational data practices. We have lots of buzz going around the chief analytics officer and all of these, and I have nothing against them, but I will say that a data is a necessary and insufficient uh, prerequisite to good analytical practices around this. And that while we have lots of models of organizations doing really cool things, taking it into marts and then data and then slapping it back out onto a series of mini marts and uh, accesses and uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, dashboards and all the rest of this is, is fine. But when we learn a lesson here, when we discover data is wrong because we're looking at it in the, the dashboard here, the feedback and learning tends to be focused within the right-hand side of this diagram. Whereas I hope you clearly see that an investment back into that black box that we call data management 
would be a more effective way of solving this in the long run. Stewards are the only people who are going to be able to come up with the usage uh, around this that talks about how long it's measured and what we should do with it. Another area here that steward focus is that we'll agree that along these two dimensions here, we can either improve operations or innovate. There are no exceptions in between uh, in that. And if we put folks in there without formalized steward programs, we also agree that's wrong. And hopefully if you get nothing else from this hour that you're spending with us today, uh, that would be it. And I hope that you agree that Walmart has a good reputation, a well-earned reputation for being able to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of its operations. And that Apple perhaps has the innovation buzz uh, around all of those. Well, I want you to imagine taking uh, Johnny Ive, who is the individual who used to do the Apple uh, uh, product rolls out, uh, rollouts, and he would, you know, just have his head explode if you dropped him into Walmart's environment to do it cheaply, right? That's not the way he does his creation. Similarly, I imagine if you took the Walmart people down there at the bottom right and dropped them into the Apple quadrant and said. We want you to be creative. They'd be like, no, 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 we optimize. That's what we do. We, it's in our DNA. We're good at that. So there's a sequence in here that we want stewards to look at as well. Many organizations say do them both at the same time. I would also argue, unless you're really special, and a lot of organizations think they are, but if you really are, uh, take down here and earn money by helping improve things. Again, my total is more than one and a half billion dollars U.S that I have helped organizations save over 30 plus years. Uh, that's a lot of money. And so use that to then create the conditions where you can do this more correctly because only about one in 10 organizations are in fact working in this area, starting the stewardship journey at all. And that's very sad. We'd like more of them to get involved, but we also need to prove ourselves better as an industry. So let's recap a bit and we'll do some takeaways while you're getting ready perhaps for some questions uh, on this. Why is it that we need a data stewardship role? Well, we have strategy that we want to do and we have data that's being employed to do it, but there's nobody who is specifically employed in our organizations to take data and make it better. We have had lots of people doing it in the past, sometimes informally, sometimes uh, a little bit more formally, we used to call all of these topics data administration, uh, but uh, we, we, we uh, need to modernize uh, around this. So the idea is, what is the organizational strategy? Can we employ data in support of it so that our targets are easier to achieve, et cetera, et cetera? And within that, our architecture is the strategic tool that we're going to be using. We're going to try and improve the architecture around this through active as well as through passive types of measures, then what are the stewards supposed to do? Well, there are going to be some challenges resolving from day to death. So that's unfortunate, but if you ignore them, uh, I don't want to paint a bad picture in your mouth, but imagine trying to go in and work on somebody's cavity, but that person didn't discover um, uh, brushing teeth uh, at that point. So they had a very bad set of dentures, uh, sorry, teeth in their mouth uh, around that. You need some sort of framework for stewardship. It is a professional role. It's well-defined, well-understood, although most organizations don't consider that they need to do reactive as well as proactive types of activities. And think of stewardship as the main people who get things done in the data governance area on this. Again, start simply. Assign your first round of stewards. Announce that you're signing your first round of stewards. I've seen an awful lot of organizations do it poorly, but because they announced the first round when they people who wanted to become stewards weren't appointed to become stewards, and that's sort of a head scratcher right there, but different uh, different topic on that. Uh, the idea is to say, let's get all of these people on board, but maybe that's the next round and they won't quit. Uh, and find out there's a professional class of data stewards that's starting to be there. Uh, we will have some some ideas. The idea that stewardship has to be sort of a buffer between the cadence run by IT and the cadence at which data needs to evolve gradually over annual periods as opposed to weekly periods in there. But there are some foundational prerequisites around stewardship. And finally, start simply, get good at it and practice because if you continue to practice, you will do better around all of that. 
externally, again, as I said before, people don't understand, and now we're adding stewards onto this as well. It's very complex. Keep it at the data program level. Let people really get it from that perspective. And with that, Natalie, we're right at the top of the hour. I will turn it back over to you. Hopefully, we've got some good questions. Thanks so much, Peter. We do have some questions. Um, Feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A. You can also upvote existing questions. Um, I'll be reading them out in order of upvotes. So the first question that we have is, are defined business processes required for data stewardship to be successful? Good question. They are not required. What you focus on is problems. I just described it here and I'll put that slide back up uh, so that everybody follows uh, with that. Let's see. Again, I apologize for a little bit of fumbling earlier here, but uh, I think it came out. Oh, well, there we go. If the question is, is a very good one, does the process architecture need to be there? The answer is no, it does not. But if it is there, it is super helpful because of course, if you have a group of people already advocating an architectural approach to business, then they're going to have much easier time selling the data architecture time than they will uh, than they will the other. But you do not need them to have it. What you really need people to understand is that data problems show up on the other end of processes and systems, and that distorts them perhaps necessarily. But more importantly, it doesn't lead to a common understanding such that one problem can fix a multitude of things out there if it's approached from this data centric perspective. And again, the guidance here is that we have one group that's doing this, they're practicing getting good at it, they repeat the process, and they develop sustained organizational skill sets around that. So thank you for allowing me to reemphasize that point. I just think it's very important that people approach this as an organizational capabilities activity. Great, thank you. The next question is, one of the greatest challenges is establishing domain data stewards. Data governance tends to have more silo data stewards for different orgs. What's the best approach to motivate data governance councils to establish domain data stewards? I would agree that, um, that identifying domains that people are, are associated with uh, is an important characteristic here. Let me put all these up just to get them all up. And you'll notice domain data stewards here are defined as across multiple business areas. So for example, as if we're gonna manage customer data, we can anticipate that several different parts of the organization uh, will approach that. If your organization is ready to add these qualifiers to the types of stewardship, um, then it does make sense to talk about them. But let me just very briefly warn against trying to do anything other than describe what a steward is, much less the difference between a business data steward and a domain data steward. These are good definitions. They tend to be used within specialized areas, but not necessarily understood widely. So somebody's business data steward may feel that's actually with a metadata that should be shared across multiple business areas uh, in here. So the important thing is, yes, you can't attack all of your problems in data at once for starters. So to subdivide the problem, it makes absolute sense to say, great, we've got another level of division down here. Uh, perhaps it's, um, uh, again, you know, customers over here and manufacturing's over there and research and development's over there. Those are great ways to start the process, but don't try to pull it all together and have a perfect comprehensive architecture at once. Instead, take one of those areas, particularly if you have limited resources. And just a little quick side note here, uh, my federal government customers that I'm working with at the moment are very fortunate because of a uh, new law that was passed in 2018. They are getting million dollar uh, implementation budgets for some of these activities. And so we're gonna have a very nice perspective on the federal government having done perhaps more work and faster work uh, than the business sector in this uh, instance around here. But again, our question was about domain data stewards. So I wouldn't start out by identifying anything other than a few people who are going to be data stewards. Let them spend some time, see if they can determine easily where a source of good investment might be on the part of the organization. 
carve out that piece, give it a candidate uh, temporary test, uh, you know, name and say, but, but, you know, what's the alternative to this, to, to moving forward and iteratively improving our practice? The alternative is I'm going to sit down in advance and I'm going to tell you exactly where everything is and what it's going to be called and how it's going to differentiate X from Y and all. Now, are there people in your organization who have been thinking about these problems for a long time? Yes. Could you make use of their expertise? Yes. But don't implement their plan directly in there without trying it out in private and seeing how it works. Because oftentimes, while these things work terrifically from one perspective, they work less well when actually forced to go across and work, for example, on the side of somebody who's a data exchange partner or a regulator, which is even worse. I don't want to piss those guys off. Uh, anyway, great question, and I, I do appreciate that. Domain data stewards, tough things, evolve them gradually rather than try to put them together all at once, just as I would never introduce any of these qualifications in here in the word data steward. I just want, it's gonna be hard enough getting people to know what a data steward is, much less differentiate them. Uh, just one more point, Natalie, before I go back to your next question on this. Uh, I forgot to make this point earlier, but the legacy data steward is the fun one. What do you define as legacy, uh, either data or legacy systems? And I say anything that's in production is legacy. So uh, that uh, actually shortens that particular issue as opposed to figuring out, oh, five years or COBOL or whatever it is that you want to do. Anyway, Natalie, that's why I like doing this. And we've got a great group out there asking great questions. Yes, thank you. The next question is, in your experience, which is the best data governance framework, guidelines, best practices, and so on? Well, I don't think there is a best. And the reason for that is because I call data governance a bespoke offering. I don't mean that in the sense that you have to go out and buy a very expensive, well-tailored suit, but every organization is different. And let me give you what I consider to be the most powerful example around that. Uh, if you remember a couple of years back when we all used to travel through uh, Heathrow and other airports around the world, we would see software vendors having signs on the runways and in the terminals and things that say, all the best companies use our software, whatever that happened to be. Uh, no, no bad ideas around it, good, good software. But if company X and company Y are competing in the market and they're both using the same architecture, it means they're using the basic same process architecture. And the only thing left to differentiate their offering is around business uh, in there. So it's a very tricky process to look at that and say, hey, within that context, how are we going to do this better? And the idea is if we can figure out what works for us, then that will work better. So again, I use the word bespoke, and it really means your organization is gonna have different priorities than your competition and than your other business partners. The stewards are the people who get to know these better. And so when people ask for a framework, there are seven good ones out there. I think I have a, a YouTube video that you can uh, go get access to to take a look quickly at, at what those look like uh, in there. And they're good places for you to balance. I, I do recommend in a governance group, uh, and obviously if it's governance stewards would be involved, but if it's a governance group to look at each of these things and try them on for size and say, how would that work here? Uh, again, different uh, uh, presentation on that. I forget whether we've done it this year or not uh, around here, but I think I know there's one out there on, on the YouTube videos. So when we say bespoke, we're not saying expensive bespoke, but we're saying fitted in a way that works for the organization. Uh, again, I'll just give you one more very quick example here, but I was fortunate to be invited to participate in the Army's rollout of data governance many years ago. And the interesting piece of it was that the Army actually has a culture of governance. Your shoes are governed, uh, your, your manners are governed, your weapon is governed, uh, your job titles are governed. Everything in the Army is governed. And when the Army discovered something wasn't governed, they went, we have to fix that as a gut level instinct. So in this case, we were able to make the Army's culture work very well in its favor. And let's be very frank here, we were able to take also an increased troop deployment rates through better governed data through the use of army data stewards. Uh, again, wonderful stories. I haven't had a chance to write that one up yet, but it is a, a good one and uh, certainly is something that we'd like to do, at least right here in the good old US of A. All right, Natalie, enough on that one. That was a great question. I love that. What's next? 
Thank you. The next question is who leads the data stewardship group when formed? Great question. Let's put it back to the right slide so I can uh, address it on there. And the idea is there really don't have to be a lot of different players in this scenario. I make it very simple, uh, particularly again at first, just because it's easier to explain to people and get them to do the things that we want them to focus on uh, around this. There we go. I finally got to my slide. And again, leadership, extra people, uh, people who are not really involved at all, and of course our stewards, and we'll put our line around the left hand side there. So who should be your leader in this area? Well, one of the, those of you that know me know I like to travel, and uh, one of the most enjoyable characteristics is to come to an organization where people go, oh, I'm going to do this, and I'll see these sort of I call them gray beards without being uh, gender specific around that. But people who've been around the organization for a long time, who really understand its data and understand what needs to be done. And they hear management come up and announce a fairly simplistic approach of we're buying Tableau. And I, I don't mean to besmirch Tableau, it's fine software. But Tableau suffers from the same problem everything else does. Uh, if you have bad data, anything awesome is not going to change your results to be something other than awful results uh, around that. So there's got to be somebody in this leadership role who is able to say, ah, yes, these are the priorities. I know how to get resources. I know how to keep people on these tasks. I know how to do the things that need to be done for this organization. And that's not just looking at a textbook and the textbook's not going to tell you what your organizational data challenges are. They've got to translate these concepts in here. So I've seen stewards that were in de facto uh, leaders. I've seen them kind of like, if you remember back to the old program, I'm really dating myself, but most of you remember Mac uh, and Radar O'Reilly, you know, right there whispering in whoever the commander's ear was of exactly what needed to happen. Uh, and it's not that leadership is, is incapable of this, but it's more rare that within the data community, we find the leadership than finding a business user who really understands the value of this. Again, recall the, the slide that I showed you that had data things happening and then wonderful things happening over there. Um, give your organization some time. Uh, see who steps up for various meetings. You'd be surprised. I've seen wonderful people over, again, my, my 30 plus year career here who have just made amazing uh, transformations. And they, yes, while there used to be a data modeler at one point, nothing wrong with that. Uh, they've actually blossomed in this leadership and are able to help the organization really move forward uh, around those areas. I've also seen, uh, I ran into a fellow who used to teach information engineering at one point. I, he came back to an organization that I was still working with. And I said, well, what are you doing? He said, well, I got tired of that. Nobody was listening to me. So I'm now teaching requirements analysis. Okay, fine. You know, that was clearly not an individual that was going to go off and become a leader in those areas. I do think that we run into the same kind of challenge that we've run into from the CIO community. And that is that when we put, first put CIOs out there, and again, just not, don't blame me, but I was part of the group that put together uh, the original law that mandated CIOs in the federal uh, environment. And our first question was, well, we should put the most knowledgeable techie person in there. Well, that didn't necessarily translate into good leadership characteristics. I think that's part of what the questioner is getting at. But in addition to that, then we went with MBAs and said, well, we could put a manager in. That hasn't worked out as well either. So now we're trying to figure out what makes a great CIO. And we have the same challenges around data as well. Uh, again, sometimes it's going to be down to a characteristic of an individual, perhaps uh, in using the same word I used in the previous question, bespoke the ability to, to have something that really works well for the organization that may not work as well for another organization. In which case, again, the goal guidance for organizations is to nurture this talent, to make it known that being able to do this. I mean, just imagine if your group was better able to comply with regulation. If that was a skill that your organization had, wow. Then when we get to Basel IV, sorry, didn't mean to give everybody a, a nightmare uh, around that. Yes, yeah, when you get to Basel IV, you'll be better equipped to do it. And perhaps at a rate that makes you competitive with the competition, which means you can put more money into that quadrant of trying to develop new and innovative things. Again, great question. Thank you very much for it. Back to you, Natalie. 
Thank you. The next question is, what are the main stoppers you have faced in data governance implementation and how have you solved them? The real key there is value. Uh, it, organizations tend to profess value. Excuse me. Um, so being able to link the outcomes of these activities to some tangible outcomes is absolutely key to making sure that happens. Uh, it's not an easy process, but it's actually not that hard. Uh, and again, just to, not to hawk a, a particular book, but I do have a book out there that is focused specifically on uh, understanding data values that come out from here. So when you're looking at this, we've gotten good over the years of making data things happen. Woohoo! We now need to get good at making organizational things happen. And those, as I mentioned before, could be increased deployment ability on the part of US military. That's considered to be a national priority. Uh, a bone marrow center that we worked with for many years was able to increase the number of successful bone marrow transfusions from 3,000 annually to 6,000 annually. These are the things that move the needle. These are the things that help the organization keep its eye on the prize. Any organization that doesn't believe that data plays a role in achieving its strategic objective, uh, I, I, I just simply haven't encountered this. Uh, again, I will go further. All organizational problems, challenges, whatever you want to call them, have a data component to them. And that data component is something that organizations are not quite aware of. And that's really the essence of getting data centric because it means you start with the data perspective and instead of solving one problem in an isolated instance, even though it may be painful, you're able to solve classes of problems. And that's a huge value in there. So get to the point where you can practice. I mentioned this book, it's called Monetizing Data Management. That's available at Amazon. It's less than 100 pages. It's got 17 different cases that you can go in and look at to see if any of those patterns are useful for you. So I don't mean to sell you all books. My goal is to give you guys data education uh, around this, and that's uh, exactly what I intend to do. So again, thank you for the question. Value is where you get that buy-in. If you don't have value, it just becomes an unfunded mandate and scares people. Thanks so much. We do have a couple of uh, requests for the data steward template that you mentioned. Are, are we? Yes, it's, it's in the slides. Absolutely. Great. That'll be part of the slides. Awesome. So the next question then is, I appreciate the reference to the importance of data management. It is so often overlooked. We have defined data trustees and stewards by functional business area, HR, finance, registrar, et cetera. But there's a big gap between these people and their expertise over the data they steward. These are the folks that are ultimately responsible, but they don't have the knowledge or expertise to actually function as a steward. How can organizations address, address the data literacy gap of their um, stewards? Again, very good question and a difficult question because unfortunately it involves the need for more. Now, I, I would first of all say that while stewards need training, my order of precedence in an organization is slightly different. I start out my data literacy efforts with organizations at the executive level because they make decisions and they don't understand that they're making these decisions and consequently they don't understand the impacts, the long-term consequences. A very simple uh, example of that is an organization that installs Salesforce. Now you all know Salesforce, it's wonderful software. <laughs> Excuse me though, there's no way that an end user being presented with bad data in Salesforce understands the very fine distinction between Salesforce working perfectly to deliver bad data and Salesforce working as expected. Uh, in there. And so their first impression from Salesforce is that Salesforce is not good. And that's not a, a happy situation uh, in all of that. Yes, these starting out with the executives is first, then absolutely the data stewards need a literacy piece. And again, I'll just make a stainless plug for my book on data literacy uh, on sale right now. Uh, it's a great place to start as an audio version of it if you're interested, uh, which I've had several people compliment. Uh, our colleague Susan Hanfield for uh, doing a great job on it. So you don't have to listen to me the whole time uh, in that. And then finally, I think data literacy will be best 
successful in organizations, the, the impact of a more literate workforce will be best achieved if the third group that we make data literate are our knowledge workers. And I envision a day when HR, given two candidates who are of equal category, equal uh, skills and knowledge, uh, will be able to select for the one that is more data literate as opposed to the one that is less data literate. And I also anticipate that on a regular basis, you'll have some sort of data literacy reinforcement the same way we currently have practice security practice reinforcement. Don't be exposed to fixing and things like that. Just a little reminder once a year uh, to keep all knowledge workers up to speed after, of course, they've already been uh, exercised in that. So yes, data stewards need to understand. Again, many people say, oh, well, the data stewards, they just, first of all, they own the data, right? And again, I don't agree with that. Hopefully everybody agrees with me on that as well. Uh, on that. And that the data stewards then are just supposed to make sure that the data gets delivered to the Tableau experts and the Tableau experts do wonderful things and discover that people who fly into the Richmond, Virginia airport on Thursdays like to have white convertibles instead of yellow convertibles. I'm totally making that up. But that, you know, that is a good piece. We all understand, though, from a BI expertise exercise, that the best answer from any sort of BI expertise, uh, excuse me, I said expertise, BI exercise is another question. And that becomes problematic in a number of different ways. Uh, again, as I mentioned on this slide in particular, the loop that is too close, that it only um, ricochets among the right-hand side of this diagram and does not go back and achieve the true leverage that is possible within the data management practice area in there. So that's something else that stewards have to look for and say, hey, if we're starting to see things get corrected, but let us correct it in the source systems so you all never have to correct it anymore. <gasps> what a wonderful thing. Again, again, thank you for giving me an opportunity to expand upon that. I hope I hit all the points. If not, drop in the chat and let's make sure I do. Back to you, Natalie. Thank you. The next question is, there should be a difference between data requesting regulating organizations and data providing or reporting organizations, and in general, between public versus private sector companies. So how to define best data stewards, tasks, responsibilities, according to the type of org? Excellent question. Are there, in fact, differences between an organization that is mission-focused, as would be most government entities and others, and operations that are commercially focused. Um, yeah, I'm gonna give you the answer from the literacy book, but not so much from the stewardship practice, although I think that the concept is equally appropriate. With a knowledge worker, we can, and you've already heard me say all knowledge workers should be data literate and literally certified at a literacy level, as objective literacy level. Um, again, they're entrusted with concepts such as fiduciary, so they need to understand what their role is and how they have it literally a duty uh, to do things the correct way as opposed to, well, I think I ought to do it this way uh, around it. All of these activities add up with an organization trying to do something. And let's hope that the organizations that we all work for continue to try to do the right thing. But if we're going to be an organization that professes to do the right thing, we need to have our knowledge workers educated well enough so that they can catch anything that goes wrong. Now, they are the third level of data literacy, as I mentioned before uh, in this, and that they're, they can be screened for literacy uh, scope and things like that, uh, but they can also uh, be more knowledgeable as a result of all of the, how do these things work. Uh, yeah, true story, I had one organization that I was working with was a health organization. They were having some dashboard created, and one dashboard would have variable X pointing upwards, increasing. And the dashboard right next to it had the same variable decreasing. And, you know, they, the point was, hey, folks, um, management's eventually going to be asked, how can something be both increasing and decreasing at the same time? And not knowing the answer to that question or not knowing that it's even important was, in fact, the predominant level of knowledge that we found within this organization. Uh, so very, very problematic uh, around that. Anyway, without babbling too much further, the, the, clearly I think that they're going to be different. I don't have a good idea as to what would be differences, but certain priorities in the mission area are going to drive priorities for stewardship and governance efforts 
in types of organizations, whereas a profit motive is going to guide most organizations in the other direction. Uh, again, the, the, the idea that one size fits all, that should be a perfect example of why one size doesn't fit all. That in fact, different organizations are going to need different approaches to this, but all of them are going to benefit from somebody who knows a lot about the data within specific areas of the organization. By the way, this same specialization pattern that I'm urging here applies to data science. I think that the term data science is absolutely useful, but if you tell me that you are an animal data scientist, or maybe even better still, a, a dairy farm data scientist, uh, then I know exactly what knowledge and skills you need to have in order to be useful in that environment. And I think until we take that step, it's going to be a problem. Similarly here, I think until we get all of our organizations more data literate, they will not be able to best identify what works for them. So start small, feel your way around, practice some things. Maybe you like jazz, maybe you like doing pop songs, maybe you like classical. Uh, you know, again, different ways of experiencing that music. Uh, it's a way of figuring your organization out. But of course, management wants it to be a project and when are we gonna be done by? So it is a tension that I do recognize that you face out there. Again, thank you for a great question. Hopefully I've answered it. Back to you, Natalie. Thank you. We have about five minutes left. So I think we have enough time for one more question. Um, when trying to get business units to step up and allocate data stewards, how do you help them estimate how much person time they will need to budget? Yeah, so I think they probably asked that question before I jumped in and, and we're talking about the full-time versus part-time uh, on that. Again, let me just urge you, if you do have the opportunity to sway somebody and say, I could have two people half-time or one person full-time, pick the one person full-time. Uh, and there is just so much to learn, so much to learn about your individual data sets. Again, I'm making a one in 10 piece here. It may not be that easy, but it may not be possible. But how much time? Well, what shape is your data in? If you can't answer that question, you have no idea what type of time uh, that you can play. Do you have a bunch of mad scientists that are running machine learning algorithms all over your organization? They're screening for training data. Uh, by the way, that's a, a very narrow focus and a very good way of focusing uh, machine learning activities is on your data that you haven't analyzed or on data that you actually know as opposed to going out and getting data that you don't know. Great question uh, around that. Um, if you have the opportunity, take a person who's gonna be full-time uh, around that. Thank you for a good question though. Thank you. I think that is uh, just about all we have time for. So thank you, Peter, for this excellent uh, presentation and Q&A. Just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and the slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and Shannon will send out a follow-up email to let you know the links to those and any other requested information that came up during the webinar. Thank you again for attending today, and I hope you all have a great day and rest of your week. Until next time. Natalie, thank you so much. Such a pleasant afternoon. Thanks, Peter. Have a great day, everybody.